No, you can do any Wi-Fi you want. I don't care. You can add you Rome, which I apparently have not known about until today and we have it at work. Who knew? But yes. Yeah, I got nothing. It's a skiff in here for me on my phone. So you are in Noob to Master Rapid Onboarding to Open edX Course Build. If you wanted to be somewhere else, leave No. Okay, we're good. We're all in the right spot. And um, we're gonna have lots of fun. Um, I'm gonna talk fast because that's me. Um, if you need me to slow down, holler and I can do that. Um, we're from ASU. Um, we think we're pretty awesome. I think we're pretty awesome. It's a great place to work. <laughs> But one of our core kind of missions is making education accessible at an unprecedented scale. And Open edX is a huge part of how we do that on this side. Core, we, we do Canvas because, but you know, all of our side projects, which we have a ton of, we're all Open edX. So lots of fun. We're gonna talk about the, some of those in a minute. It didn't click. There we go. So here's the agenda today. Um, we're gonna talk about us a little bit so you know who we are. Um, we are master level, so we'll tell you a little bit how we got there. We're, <laughs> we're going to go through our template, the content document, coding basic problems, studio building basics, and then post build QA. That's where we're headed. So a little bit about me. I'm Elizabeth Gordon, Assistant Director of International Instructional Design in a unit called Innovation and Emerging Niches at EdPlus at ASU. It's the longest title in the history of titles. Um, EdPlus is a course uh, service unit for ASU. So it's where ASU Online lives, kind of a big deal. We're not that. We're the other like stepsister unit, but we do a lot of really fun programs. Um, I've been in Open edX for over six years, doing all kinds of fun stuff. I've done from straight ID work, from grading to now more LMS admin program management kind of stuff. Um, and, Hi, I'm Christy Futtes-Darvich. I am the Curriculum and Learning Experience Manager. I work on this platform, Baobab. I oversee all the course creation for Baobab. We use Open edX. We have over 26,000 members. We have over 61 courses, and those courses are both in English and in French, and we have over 8,000 course creations. So, yeah, and I came into this kind of I was kind of thrown into open edX. It was like, you're going to be doing this now. I'm like, oh, OK. And I had to learn like trial by fire. And I turned to Elizabeth, I'm like, was there help? She's like, no, it's open, good luck. So I've learned a lot by messing a lot of things up and yeah. So I'm um, my start um, in most of the main stuff I did on Open edX was on the Young Thinkers program. I did do a pilot program for the Starbucks Global Academy, which has now taken off and it's huge. Um, they've got like hundreds of thousands of course enrollments. They're putting us all to shame because it's Starbucks. Um, I've also, the grading work I did was on the universal learner courses. So um, we've touched those. Between these four projects, we've got um, 130 courses with nearly a million course enrollments. Young Thinkers program has 70,000 learners. We've got 159,000 course enrollments. So we got a lot of stuff out there. So just kind of so you understand, we kind of know what we're talking about a little bit with doing this process. Here's the fun part. We've taken dozens of open edX noobs and turned them into studio masters. And we'll tell you how that, what that process looked like um, today. Um, obviously there's, it's a process, but um, we'll kind of get through it. These are some of those. Understand some of the folks up here are undergraduate students who came and worked to, came to us as student workers. So college students, we brought them in within a couple of weeks, they're in their masters building, going crazy. So um, we can do this. Click. All right, so now let's learn a little bit about you. Join our Slido, um, wanna know kind of your role. We'll have another slide. It'll tell me how, whether you're a noob or a master or what, where you are on the scale. Um, there's a couple seats down front. Yep. If you're needing a seat, just- And you can come by as well. Come on down, it's fine. So we'll give you a few minutes to kind of join in. Tell us, are you developer? Are you LMS admin? Are you an ID or are you a teacher professor? And if I missed a category, tell me I missed something. I, it's not gonna help with the poll, but you could just tell me I'm not, none of the above. I'm something totally different. <laughs> I love watching live polls. It's like so much fun. <laughs> 
had a full room. A little heavy on the developer side today. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Woohoo, go IDs, go IDs, you can do it. There's some seats down front. Yeah, right down, right, right, right down here in the front row, right up front. Yeah, <laughs> that's all right. All right, I'm gonna, I think you can still do the, how, how anybody not done on the first slide besides walked in late, dude, okay. <laughs> Walked in late, dude. Not that I'm calling you out at all. Hi. You're not late. You're coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I literally would shame students who walked in late. Hi, so nice you're here today. You missed stuff already. I'm not going back. All right. We're going to go ahead. So, what level are you with Open edX? Are you master level, warrior, dabbler, or total noob? It'll help because that way I can either slow down on some spots or we can zoom right by and I just will tell you the high points. Nah, she's master. She just doesn't want to admit it. <laughs> and for those of you who are in the middle of the pack, um, here, here's what I'm gonna tell you. That's what I tell Christy all the time. OpenEdX has gremlins. You know, that whole, again, pop culture reference, I, I said we'd find a way to sneak some in. Um, you know, the whole, you know, you water or feed them after midnight, and then they turn into little monsters. Other than that, they're, that's open edX. And then they magically turn back to the crisply cuddlies, and the, the developers tell you, what? It works perfectly. Like, no, it wasn't working. I promise it wasn't. All right. <laughs> Give it 24 hours and check again. All right. Looks like we got a pretty even mix in here. Good to know. All right. So then here's the deal. I'm going to, some of this stuff I'm going to go pretty fast through. Um, if you're like, wait, wait, what? Just again, shoot up the hand, be like, do that again because you went too fast. I'm, I'm confused. So if you're going to come in, let's say just for all intents and purposes, you've got a newbie comes into your office and you're like, I need you to build 10 courses for me over the next six weeks. How are you going to get them to be able to do that for you? Now we're assuming these folks are not your SMEs. SMEs and working with SMEs, whole different ball game, but you do need to do some work with them too. So just not a whole lot, but you need to do a little bit with them. So we'll get to that in a minute. But first thing you need to do before you even send anybody to go build a course, develop a course template. You need to have a template course so that every single course that starts in your platform has that basic kind of stuff in it. So what do you need to have in there? Yeah, we will have it, by the way, if it's on the screen, it's going to be in a document that we're going to give you. Don't kill your hand trying to write all that. Don't take crappy photos. It's all gonna be in a doc. So yeah, we'll, I promise we'll share. Key takeaway for your template. Include everything in your template course that is in every single course, because then it's just there. You don't have to remind anybody to build it. You don't have to go into advanced settings and break anything. And by the way, if you're a noob, don't touch advanced settings. Don't do it. You can irretrievably break a course in advanced settings. I have done it. Had to start over. It was no fun. So lesson learned. Don't go into advanced settings if you're a noob. So. You're going to want to have your uh, intro section. So how do you want your learning objectives, your syllabus, your instructor intro, your course tour, academic integrity info, if you use that kind of stuff, welcome board, discussion board, coffee shop, whatever it is. Um, incidentally, our approach to template courses was based off of our work using Quality Matters to build quality online courses. So again, if you're looking at just building a good online course, this stuff hits a lot of those markers. Can help you with the content alignment and you know align with learning objectives and all of that. But the other stuff you beat if you have a good template. Um, you wanna have your standard pages, have a syllabus page, FAQ page, support page, textbook page. Those um, appear up at the top bar inside your course. Those are really great for stuff you're gonna have to keep going back to so you don't have to figure out where is it in the outline. You'll wanna have sample sections. Why? 
teaches your folks how to do naming conventions. You should have a naming convention. It would be really great if all of your courses do the same thing, like it's module one, not lesson one. Kind of come to some kind of agreement and everybody do the same thing. You're still gonna have your outliers, but at least if you give them a model, it, it helps. It, it makes it easier for your students. Um, if you've got frequently used sidebars, I'll show you those in a minute, put those in one of those sample sections. So you kind of, that coding is there, that setup is there. Everybody knows kind of how we are going to approach those kinds of things. Include an assessment sample. Why? Because the quiz tool in Open edX does not come with instructions. You need to include instructions. So whatever those are, you know, whatever the process is, if you use a proctoring tool, include that information. Um, if there's an academic integrity reminder, you usually do right before they take a quiz, pop that in there. And then again, it's there. You can copy those into all the modules where you've got a quiz. You want to have a conclusion uh, section. We do a congratulations because we do non-credit courses. Um, but you might want to have a course survey. If there's any rules about the final grading processes, they have X amount of time to appeal something. If it takes X amount of time for their final grade to show up over on their official transcript, tell them that all right there in there and it's done. You don't have to answer a million questions. Um, we do references and resources where it's like, here's all of that lovely citation information for everything we shared in the course. It's at the end of the course and that's there. It's already the formatting for that is there. Might be a good idea to include a staff only section. This is the stuff that the course team needs to know how to, to, how to work with the discussion boards, how to grade if they use ORAs you're going to need instructions on how to grow, grade an ORA and all those fun rules about the ORAs. Um, you might want to have your QA checklist in there. That way it's handy and they can do that QA checklist right beforehand. Again, advanced settings. I'm going to say this probably about three times this morning. Um, set your advanced settings in your template course. Then nobody has to go in there and mess anything up. Most importantly, um, for the build process, you want to make sure your X blocks are all activated on that advanced settings. All the ones that you have available are there. If you have LTI resources, those little keys are in there, all that stuff set up because that'll export and it's in every course and then it's just done. Um, and if you've got an institution approved grading schema, make sure that's set up. And then again, it just exports what's an A, what's a B, what's a C, is it pass fail, whatever that stuff is. Um, if there is, again, if you as an institution or organization have decided we're going to have, you know, by a section, if it's homework, you know, midterm final, if you've got, again, if you can get anybody to agree on that, build it in and then it's just done. Um, again, you can, you know, your outlier instructors can go in and change that, but at least it's set up the way you want it to be. And if they change that, that's on them. Okay, so here's what to, oh. There's examples from Baobab Christie's um, Sub-Saharan Africa. Yes. I, just, I'm sorry to ask if maybe a, a specific question and we can talk afterwards if this is a more of a one-on-one -on -one thing, but I'm, my name's Alan Jameson. I do product analytics at, at TU edX. And one of the things we found in both kind of our legacy degree programs as well as in uh, edX courses is that engagement rates with content in the first module is typically pretty low. So the kind of the, the welcome, the instructor bio, bio stuff. I'm curious if you have opinions about whether that is it important? Problem, or is that just kind of a, a normal I, as a teacher when I teach, I solve by putting in a quiz on that crap. Yeah. And then they have to do it because it's in the grade. And if you don't do it, you're hurting yourself. And it's like easy A starts right here. So that's how I solve that. But from an ID and just an administrator standpoint, whether they use it or not, it's important to include it because they need to know that. And if they fail because they didn't read it, that's on them. So yeah, sorry. From both perspectives, yes, still do it. As a noob. Um... I don't have a startup template and a lot of agreement on these things. Is there within the community at large uh, a sharing environment where these startup templates exist? There should be. Let's start a work group on that. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not even kidding. Yeah. Yeah, you do. 
Yeah, you do. Cool. Good, good, great questions. Thank you, all of you. Um, here's our welcome page on um, Baobab. They've got a really great graphic designer. <laughs> so theirs are really pretty. Um, not that this has anything to do with like functionality, but pretty helps. Again, Open edX on its own isn't really pretty. It doesn't take a whole lot to add some banners. Canva works, but if you've got a great instructional designer, then they turn out like this. Um, so again, this is just like the welcome stuff, the description. Um, we do pre and post course self-assessments. So you can, because um, again, competency, we're doing competency-based um, courses. So it's, did you increase your competency at whatever the course is doing? Um, for our metrics. Um, we do the really pretty congratulations page, how to get your certificate. Again, if you're not a credit bearing program, you're doing certificates, you need to tell them how to get it and what that, how, what that process looks like. So we've got a PDF there that we include. Um, I mentioned sidebars. Um, one of the fun things about Open edX is you can in fact go into the HTML. One of the fun things about Open edX is you don't have to go into the HTML. But if you want it to look in a specific way, you have to go into the HTML. Um, so, and rather than make my folks know this, we figured this out with one of my software engineering student workers and then just provided the coding. So we've got these cute little boxes where we can set off information, kind of like in a textbook where they have, you know, those little sidebar informations and the pictures and the whatever, we just do that. So we've got helpful tips. We, again, great graphic designer created some cute little icons to make things a little bit more engaging the coding is in there if you're interested in how we set things off because it was a little wonky figuring out so we're sharing and it doesn't have to be orange you can make it any color you want i'm providing the coding i promise is on the document i've got a qr code don't worry i give it to you when you take your course template and you export it and import it into a new course what carries over this is a very common question um course content and structure all comes over course dates will come over um the grading policy comes over if you've got groups set up so if you cohort out your discussion boards or any of the content that's going to come over um if you do like the advanced setting page anything you put in there that's going to come over if you do matlab api keys any of those kind of lti passports that kind of stuff will come over um user data is not going to come over um and you'll have to basically reset your start dates and blah 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 all of that but that's all going to come over really important thing if you use a live existing course as a course template and you export it which if you haven't created a template yet but you have courses that are live that's a great way to do it figure out which one of those is the best one export it import it into a template course delete all the course content and then start from there change the course date and make sure it's not visible when you do that we've had folks get into our course template and be like is this a real course <laughs> no forgot to check your visibility um, and just lock that lock that down so anyway um all right so this is the stop and make you interact join our jam board um at the tiny url um circle up with a couple of people and what else would you include in a course template that we didn't talk about um so we're going to give you about five minutes to do that we're going to have uh grogu play us some tunes so we've got a little tune minutes. We're gonna give you about five minutes to kind of circle up, see what's in there. The list of what we include or recommend include is on the Jamboard. So you don't have to try and remember what that is. Um, Jamboard, okay. Jamboard any, any Jamboard tips, it's like there's a little sticky note off to the left and you just basically drag it over. You can change the color um, and then just put your name on the, on the sticky notes if you need it. Yeah, no. Okay. All right. So we'll give you like five minutes to join in and come up with some ideas. Like, stop to the left. Yeah. 
all right hey i love these examples this is awesome um so let's see i i have a laser pointer so i'm gonna use it because it's fun because i don't usually have one when i present so i'm just like this is awesome um yes if there are styling examples for like frequently used things that's definitely like our our little sidebars if there's anything else you're going to use absolutely include it um style guide love it accessibility information absolutely um i think all of our ids need to know that like don't use pink text i know it's pretty you can't read it. Don't try and use red and green to differentiate between things. It doesn't work. I'm hoping, so for us, we actually put most of our teachers who are going to teach it online through a how to teach online class that includes some of that. Um, so if you haven't done that, you should probably think about doing some kind of base level education for your SMEs um, to kind of help them make that scary transition from, oh, I have a classroom of students to, I have a classroom of, computer people 
it's scary. Um, I, I made the transition so I can attest to that. Um, instructions on how to navigate the classroom. I think somebody else also said like a, uh, uh, intro about the course, definitely all of that user support stuff at the very beginning in that opening section, super helpful. It helps to also know the digital literacy rates of your users. Like if they're going to need some, how do I upload a document? We have a course for that for a lot of our students where we have them do that before they go on. But yes, user education is great. Um, Tom, love this. Dealing with international times and deadlines. Um, if you've got a global population, absolutely. What time is it? What does it mean when edX tells me that the deadline is something something UTC, which is the default in case you didn't know. Um, had no idea what that was. Took me forever to figure it out. Um, study resources, absolutely. Any kind of student support stuff. If your um, university or organization has a student support center, tutoring, help me make my paper not be horrible. Yes, please tell them where to find all of that. That's excellent. Um, creating community, yes. Doing that whole around the world. Um, I'm jumping all over the place. Yes, um, help resources for instructors, where to get help. Um, where to get more information that should be in your staff section for sure. Um, anybody see anything I didn't call out that you want to absolutely call out placeholder assets. If you're proctor, if you, yeah, if you have proctoring information, if you do proctoring, please, 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 please make your users do a test proctoring, give them points for doing a test proctoring, like literally make them test proctor. They're all going to think that they are master level on everything digital because they're, what are we at Jen? Are we zing right now in college? Whatever. They all think they're amazing until they're a stressed out and go to take their test and then they freak and they've just bombed the test. You don't want that. So make them, make them do a test. Um, sorry. Pro tip extra that has nothing to do with open edX. Um, if you have brand specific spawns, absolutely. Um, we don't tend to worry about that, but we uh, pre-course survey glossary. Yep, for sure. Uh, I can't read from there. Real messages. <laughs> um, that is not the subject of today's TED talk, but oops, TM. Um, that's not here, but that is, again, we use QM as one of our rubrics. Instructor presence is huge in online classes. Yeah, um, unless you literally market your classes as non-facilitated, it's a do-it-yourself. You need to teach your instructors to get in there and post messages that say, hey, Tom, thanks for mentioning that in the discussion board. That was great. They also should do things like record videos of themselves at home in their office going, hey, it's snowing outside. I know it's cold, but we're in module three. Like literally that kind of stuff matters. It's how you start to build community and encouraging your students to talk to each other. Like you got to build that because we're online, but that connection, as we all learned in the COVID world, it really matters. It makes a big difference. And in terms of student success and persistence in online courses, instructor presence is one of those things. So if you haven't taught your teachers how to do that, yes. Ha, you don't. Um, no. <laughs> so one of the ways to do is promoting uh, community TAs. So literally finding um, a, a student that you know is good promoting them as a community TA and helping them build the, the community. And edX has a little uh, user role where you can do um, promote somebody to a, a group community TA or a community TA. So they actually have the power to go in and flag things. So that's one way to do it. Um, a learner who's already in the course, taking that assignment, gets extra credit, gets whatever to go in and help build that community. Um, teach instructor presence, um, still like those, those, those videos from the instructor where you're talking to the class, like that still works at scale. It doesn't matter if there's 200 users, 5,000 users in a course. Um, it still matters. I've got one course that's got 5,000, but again, ours are all billed as instructor lists. So we don't worry about that little component, but one of the other projects I'm working on, that's what we're going to do. It's like literally that whole, do some community TAs, get them in there doing that. And your instructors, it's not just a, I mean, sidebar need to hurry. Um, <laughs> sidebar can't do this, but the, um, the glossy videos are really, they're cool. They're awesome. We all love the whole, let's do the Hollywood style production, but the one where it's literally your professor sitting at the computer talking to you about this class that we're doing right now, dude, that helps a lot. So like, it's that balance. Yeah. You want it to be great and pretty and whatever, but like, it's the instructor telling you 
hey, when I learned this, it was awesome. And I know we're going to do this problem next week. And here's what I think you should do about it. Like it's, it's, that, it's how you fix that. And that works whether you've got 5,000 students or 50. You're welcome. Um, I'm going to get us back on the slideshow. Any other, anything else while I navigate the tech of this? All right, let's see if we can do this without glitching. Awesome. Next step is to plan your content in a document. This is where you get to your SMEs and training your SMEs a little bit. Um, we start with giving them an actual template um, where we give them this stuff. So um, include everything in your course document template that is going to be um, in the course and mirror the setup that is in your template. So if your template requires that you have um, kind of that course overview at the beginning, include the fields for that course overview in the beginning of your document. So your SME just fills those in for you. So it's all in there. Um, include the whole, see uh, where it's right here, literally the word subsection and then a colon and then title. Literally include the section title, subsection title, and then the SME changes the word title to the actual title, but leaves the word section. Why? Because your builders, that's going to help them that they understand what, what goes in each of those fields. There are a lot of fields that aren't, <clears throat> don't listen, not logical. <laughs> Sorry, we got, we, got a, we got an official rep down here. It's, there's some stuff that's not logical where you have to like title it. And if you try and have your builders figure that out, they're going to freak out and be like, wait, what do I put in each of these fields? Just plan that out for them. So have your SMEs think that through because your SMEs are going to be able to think through the content and what will make sense because that's the stuff that appears in that top that breadcrumb thing at the top and you want it to make sense and not be dumb like section two section two section two it's like no don't do that okay so uh section titles subsection titles your unit titles these are your page titles so that's like that page level title so the hard part is literally these two and actually it's probably just a subsection include all course content so if there's a pdf that you want in the course have the link to that PDF on the Google Drive or your shared drive or wherever, a link wherever your, your builder can get that and put it in the order you want it. Um, and do things like PDF X blocks, this, embed this. If there's a YouTube video from wherever, whether it's outside or your media sharing, like is that link in the order that you want it to appear? Just have that all in there. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so this is, this is my baby. I developed this. Um, yeah, it's okay. You're forgiven. So as I said, in five years or four years, we made 60 courses, French and English. And I am the pretty much the only ID on the Baobab team. So I had to touch every single one of those 60 courses. So I could not, and some of them I even had to write myself. So I couldn't do all that and build. So we got student workers. So I really had to teach them fast how to do this. And this is like, this is so this came across because you know I saw the other open edX with these complicated spreadsheets. And then I would have to teach my student workers how to understand the spreadsheet. And I was like, okay, this is not working. I'm basically going to recreate the course outline on here. And then also instead of section, I make sure section is a title one. Make sure subsection is a title two. Same thing with unit and page. And then we also have codes so that way they know like when they're in open edX and they're building that this is supposed to be a heading three or a four. And so they, I tell them what the hierarchy is for the ADA. They don't realize they're doing that, but that's what I've set up. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it was like more like a storyboard. And so it was like, uh, yeah, it was when I saw it this second, like for the open X conference in San Diego, I think. And I was like, and I liked it because I like the storyboarding part. So I still storyboard. I still do all that, but it's more for me as I'm going through the process. And then this is a document I can hand to anybody who's worked on anything and they can do it. So Elizabeth, you want to? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, no. No. And sometimes I do put the code in there. Like if I'm playing with an iframe and I figure making sure like a, like a website or something will iframe and I've already played with it and I know it work, I'll just go ahead and throw that code in there. Yeah. And I'll put, tell them, I'll just put them iframe and they know, okay, iframe, I got to put this code in the iframe. Um, this saved my butt when I 
broke that course in advanced settings because all of our course content was in a document. Um, not that it happens a lot, but if something goes desperately wrong, if all of your content is there, you've got that backup. I mean, it's still, you have to rebuild it. It bites. And incidentally, once you've built a course, export that puppy and archive it somewhere so you don't have to start over. Just yeah. pro tip. Uh -huh. Sorry. So this is Elizabeth. You want to go to the next way page? There we go. And this is kind of what it looks like when I hand it to them. Of course, there's graphics. And and I also do like the sidebars, and those are already in there, and they just copy paste that, and I'll just be like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I'll have the images where I want them. If they want them to use a certain icon, I'll be like, learn more icon here, discussion board icon here. And, and it's pretty easy. And I hand it to them, I give it to them. They tell me they're done. I come back in. I'm like, they're the sous chef. I'm the chef. I come in and I make it pretty. And I'm even able to give this to professors who's never worked on Open edX and be able to get back from them a usable document that I could then quickly fix and hand to my student worker. Yes. It's a lot more time. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I feel like the studio build is pretty fast. So I think right now our current student worker, I think she can probably, if I give her like one of our main simple courses, get at least all the components built and the text in in under an hour. But we are not doing huge college level courses here. That's another thing to keep in mind. But for me, this is like, this could take weeks because there's so many people involved and so many things involved. So it is a lot of work up in front, but it is worth it. Yeah. Um, if you've got, here's the thing, like if you've got SMEs who are writing content for you, who you're going to use them once on one course, you don't want them to have to figure out edX at all. And so literally that's why you just give me a document. And so then your, your, your masters at building, they worry about the whole, I need a text component. I need a video component. I need a this. So it's, it's that whole, uh, like an assembly line process yeah. where it's the division of labor and who does what. So yeah, back, back row. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> think it's for, yeah for if you're on a mac if you're on a mac when you paste in it's paste and match style or paste through a text editor i know there's a way to do i think it's a right click but you have to program your right click on a pc i don't i don't pc so i don't know but do not just straight copy because you will get garbage code and it will Jack everything. It's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> and I teach my students when you put in text, just go into the HTML. That's how we do it. And just like last week, we were onboarding a new guy and he had done it all like that. And I sent him back <laughs> and he had to redo the, but it was good. And then I we were working on another project and he's like, Did you just copy paste a whole bunch of code in there? I was like, I did. I don't see. So it, it is. So, like, once it's so like the first time they build, you really have to watch carefully and make them go back and fix but then they got it and then they're going to be correcting you. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Got it. Yeah. Most most of our courses are 1 to 2 hours, so it's about hour to hour. So if it's a, if there are 15 hours worth of co of course content to build, but it, there's also scale at how many interactives do you have? Is it all straight text video? Cause that's easy. Are you doing a lot of drag and drops? Are you doing a lot of whatever? It depends. And are you t dealing with a noob or are you dealing with a master? Um, so sorry, it, testing. testing is the last step, which we'll get to. So um, I'm mindful of time. I want to be able to get through everything. So let's. Let's kind of go on. I can't remember if you've got a slide, Chris, or if it's me. It's me. All right. Here is your lifesaver. Um, everybody, everybody 
who is going to do anything in building process from your SME to your QAers need to learn how to code problems. Um, it's not that hard. Um, the, the template is in the tool, but teach them to do it in your doc and it will save you a whole lot. Why? Because if you just let them build in a question, they will forget to include feedback. And then you will be going back and say, is this a correct answer or not a correct answer? What is the feedback you wanna to give to a user if they get it wrong? Um, teach them to do it from the beginning. So um, here's two types. So this is just your typical multiple choice. Um, this is literally straight from the problem component in edX, I did not make this one up. So this is literally straight in there. So this isn't in my doc because it's it's in the edX system. So this is a multiple choice question. Like it's a exclamation point randomizes the options. X is the correct answer. These are incorrect answers. These little double dealies are how you specify feedback. Yeah, open double dealies, close double dealies. If you wanna give them a hint, it's the little straight dealy dealies. Yeah, I don't know what they're called. Tell me you know what they're called and I, but they're fancy brackets. All right, we're, we're, we're nailing it. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you want the, if you want a number or a text, um, it's the same, it's the little equal sign. This gives you your variable. Um, there's, if you're, we've got this QR code at the end too, so I'm not gonna hang around for you to grab that, um, but our sample document has that. And we're, we're, we're getting there, we're gonna do theirs. Um, here are five like actual real life problems from some of our courses. And so this is what the code looks like on this side. And this is what it looks like on the OAX side. Um, so literally it's radial buttons and you click one of those and you can see that one's the right answer. True, false are just basically multiple choice with only two options. Uh, it took me a few minutes to figure that one out uh, when I first got in there. Um, check all that apply. Um, pro tip, these confuse users and they're hard to code and they're really hard to answer. So just, you know, that's personal opinion, but if you wanna check all that apply, um, that is the one where it gets a little funky because you put in the word selected. If they select this answer, here's the feedback. Then you do a single bracket, a single bracket, unselected, and here's the feedback. Um, do not just say, this is the right answer or this is not right, because if they, it all comes up at the bottom, and they won't know which one it's referring to. So you need to say option A is not the right answer, try again, or you know, put the actual thing in there. So you've got to actually give them that feedback. Um, and then these are drop downs. These are really kind of cool. Again, these are in the, the sample document. So now let's get you in there. Um, we're going to know that this is a Google doc. If you join it, um, circle up and just try to put in the right HTML coding for the problem. Yeah, let's do like half a row, let's split you here. I think, what do we have? Five, we have five groups, make five groups. So like all of you, all of you, all of you, and maybe the middle group up. Um, there's the, they're labeled in the document group one, group two, group three, four. So one, two, three, four, middle people, five. And if you didn't like it, just join a group. <laughs> just join a group. It's a democracy. Yeah, let's 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 just do three minutes. So just however far you can get in those three minutes. Or through this whole song. Through the song. Oh, wait, I keep forgetting I'm not on one. Oh, did it not work? Oh, yes, there is a bonus section. Yep, 
take a question that somebody else isn't working on already. And maybe um, highlight the section you're the, the question you're working on. Yeah, so pretend that your SME just gave you this document, you're getting it ready for your builder. And you've noticed, oh, they didn't put the code in. So you're just going to quickly code it for them and send it off. And after group one, two, three, four, five, then there's some bonus ones, which are some hard ones, which we learned a lot from doing. The actual ones we have in a course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm And it takes a bit longer to face their day. That's right. And it's like a little more, so they will, and then you do, um, yeah, so more information. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to get on to the what is the uh, I want my brow in my sweaty mouth reverse bring it in the chemical All right, are you doing this or no? I am. All right, all right. How are you doing? Um, I'm pretty sure you probably didn't solve all of them. That's okay. We're gonna just for time's sake keep going. Um, if you want the answers to see whether you did it right or not, here it is. I'm not gonna walk through it. So just take the UR, take the QR code, get the URL, and go see it. But you can kind of see how a this is a pain point. And B, how it would be a really good time saver for the build if your SMEs know how to do this and just do it on a regular basis so that your builders can just go, right? Questions on kind of the process? Anything you, thoughts, comments, concerns? How often does it go one? Oh, about, about 10% of the time, maybe? But the good thing is, like, literally, if you code it wrong 
and you put it in the problem component, you know immediately because it doesn't look like it's supposed to. And it's pretty much, I mean, every now and then we'll run into it like, what did we miss? And it's it's a little kind of ang angsty. Uh, feedback to you, uh, core folks. It'd be nice if it did the little red HTML, like where it gave you the feedback in the problem component so you knew immediately, but you know, um, we'll work on it. It's okay. We, we, we know how to problem solve. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Symbols almost never work in problems. So if you were like you use an ampersand instead of the word and, it's probably going to make your problem break. Um, if you're trying to code like math problems or uh, I don't know, if you're doing an Excel course and you want all those coding in there, prepare yourself for heartbreak. No, uh, advanced editor is your friend. So just switch over to advanced editor. That's again, master level, but that's the answer for symbols in your questions. Very. How do I do this? How do I do this? And they were very helpful and we learned a lot. Okay, um, did you grab this URL? Awesome, I'm gonna keep going then. All right, so you've got your course template, you've got your content document, you've got your problems coded, it's time to build. Um, but I was really dramatic and I didn't click. Um, and I double clicked then and missed the really, wait, where's my little? Okay, obviously I missed a plan. Don't worry, you've got a plan. Um, so here's the thing. Um, once we've done that, I sit down typically with our noobs and do a Zoom session because we're we've got them everywhere and run through the basics. I'm going to run through these basics really, really fast. But honestly, once you've done your content document, the basics, just the hard part about how do you actually build, that should be a fairly straightforward process because you've you've run through it with them. You've got you've got them set with it. So um, first, you're going to export your course template. Um, so you click the little export button, export button. I'm going to go through this really fast because I'm just going to assume you've all done this before. Um, if you haven't, this is what it looks like and we can give this <laughs> or you can go through the video. Um, uh, incidentally, uh, click the downloaded export, exported course button. Nice feature to add, by the way. Loved that. Appreciate it. Um, didn't used to do that. Um, then you're going to go to your studio, you're going to click new course. Um, incidentally, I don't let noobs do this either because it matters how you set this up. There are naming conventions. If you have naming conventions, make sure whoever has the power to do this. And by the way, you can turn off the power to do this. And if you've got a big organization, you should turn off the power to do this and only give it to certain people. Um, it's a flag that you can do um, and turn on. And so only certain people have that. Um, anyway, new course. I'm not going to show you the screen because that matters, but you should have a naming convention for your course codes, your organization, your course run. That should work on a basic naming convention. Um, then you go to inside that new course. You're going to click the import button. You're going to go back. Um, and you're going to choose that download file that you just did. Um, click. Probably going to go past it. Um, pro tip. Every now and then, when you download a course export, the little tar GZ doesn't come across as a tar GZ. It'll just come across as a tar. Um, it won't import if it does that. I haven't seen it recently, so you might have fixed this, but just pro tip, if your course import doesn't work, check for the GZ and then literally just go into your file thingy and add the dot GZ. So it's tar dot tar dot GZ. Import. Yes, the GZ. Um, when you get to this part, do not leave this page. Do not click away until you get past unpacking. Then you can go away and come back. If it's a big course, if you have lots of graphics, it will take a while or if you have some later in hand. Question in the back? Oh. Yeah, yes. Pro tip, if you're downloading a whole bunch, the minute you download it, go in and change the name of the file because it's just gonna come across as course dot blah, 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 blah. It'd be really nice if the course name or code came out and the export, be really nice. Just the course code, that'd be great. Um, sorry, we have some at Expos. It'd be really nice if that came off in the download. It's right there in the system. You could grab it on that export. So I don't have 10 tar GZs and I have no idea which one is which. Um, anyway, you get to export and boom, you're in business.
Um, questions on that process. Why do I have extra? Okay, fun and games. Now you're gonna get to your course outline. And again, a lot of people are gonna look at this, this don't panic, you have your course plan so you know what you're gonna do. Um, you create a new unit by clicking the little plus sign there, the little plus sign here for your new subsection. Instantly there's one for a section, but because I was screenshotting the template, I couldn't get all of the buttons to show up, but that's where you get the new whatever dealies. This is what you're gonna get when you get inside a unit, this lovely little component menu. Um, incidentally, if you have not added any X blocks in the advanced settings, this button will not show up. Um, so this is why you want to have that in your template course so that they all show up. Um, let's start with text, which is the most frequently used. This is what you're gonna get, and here's what they do. Text is your classic WYSIWYG. Um, you can get to the HTML by clicking on the little edit HTML. Um, the rest of these are literally just pre-coded HTML boxes where it just automatically is gonna give you code that then you will adjust to your purposes. So literally you can do the same thing in all of them. It's just what you get pre-filled basically. Um, zooming image tool is really cool. Um, again, I'm not gonna get into the long detail because we're running late and it's okay. Um, but pre-can stuff is really cool. So a knot shows up when you add a video component um, and then I actually got to meet him and I was like, man, I know your face so weird, so well, this is weird. <laughs> I'm like, it's just weird. Anyway, when you put in a video component, then you click the little edit button. It's gonna show you this screen. You pop your little YouTube link in there. You're going to um, change the name so it doesn't just say video, make it descriptive, helpful. Um, cats running around having a good time would be fun. Um, pro tip, accessibility. SRTs for every single video. Even if you don't have folks with disabilities, those of us who don't like a whole lot of noise sometimes like to read the video instead of listen to it. It's helpful. Um, also great for non, yeah, non, non native speakers of English, super helpful. Um, so there you go. Um, if you have folks in multiple language, both Christy and I's projects have multiple languages. She does French, I does, do Arabic. You'll need to go over to the advanced settings button and click add a transcript language and upload your SRT. Pro tip, YouTube does auto transcript, but there are a lot of, pro, uh, of companies out there. I'm not gonna name any of them, but they're using machine language learning. It's really cheap, like 25 cents a minute to get like just machine language learning where you get 90 something percent accuracy. I don't remember exactly, but do it. It's well worth it. Okay, now let's go to problem components. Again, if you click on that, um, down at the component menu, click on problem. You're gonna get this menu. Again, these are just pre-filled with that coding. It doesn't matter which you pick. If you just, you just pick one and you're gonna copy and paste from your document. This is one of the places where you don't have to worry about coding because you're gonna come in and it's an HTML environment. If you forgot something and you're like, oh, hey, I wanna provide an explanation. You just click one of those buttons and it'll give you that text and there's a little scroll over here. It gives you like what that is like. So it's all like right there if you forgot something. Um, if you go, um, you also need to, the default is it's going to give one point for every question. And um, if you want it to do more, I like to do two. I don't know. I'm a little even number kind of a person. I want two points per question. It feels better. Um, so you can go in and here in problem weight, slightly strange wording, but okay. How many attempts you want to give them to do the question? Um, we're doing non-credit courses, so we give them three, three tries. Just so that there's an end date and they kind of make it a little bit of a thing. Um, and you're gonna wanna make sure you change the, the name of it up here. Business decision on your part. You can put every question in its own component, but then the student has to click submit for every question. That's kind of a pain. The feedback. The feedback. Yeah, so or... Yeah, it's, it's again, or you can just do all of them in one. It functions more like a Canvas quiz and you just click submit button once. Um, that's again, business decision on your part. You also just, if you're gonna put like five questions in a component, make sure you go in there and make sure it says five because it's gonna default to one because it just thinks there's one. Um, it'd be really nice if that was smart, but I'm not gonna have you waste your time on that. It's just a nice to have. Um, so just again, make sure you change that weight. Um, uh, there are, by the way, partial credit ways to do things. 
And there's a thing called a random content library, which is an advanced component if you want every student to get a different set of questions. That is master level, not even gonna cover that at all other than to tell you it exists. Doesn't matter how you do it, whether you're doing one at a time, five in one component or random content library, the SME part where you code the question is exactly the same. So that's why I just have them do it in that document and you decide what to do it with it after that. Okay, going really fast here, I know. Um, under um, add new component problem advanced tab, you get these other kind of interactives. Here's the thing. Some of these are things you have to activate in advanced settings. Some of them are not weird that some of those advanced things that you add in Xbox show up here and some show up in the other menu. It'd be nice if native things only showed up here. Again, feedback for the front. Um, <laughs> Um, if you're going to have them do something offline, so let's say you've got a coding class and you want them to up, upload a bit of code to Bitbucket or GitHub or make a website and you're going to go look at it and then grade it, there's this really cool thing called staff graded points that lets you download a CSV um, file, then you enter the points that they earned on those things that you do offline, and then you upload it and it shows up in the gradebook. It's really cool. Uh, drag and drop, one of my favorite, it kind of gamifies things. It is native. Um, note, there is drag and drop deprecated. Don't use that one. It's going away, but they can't make the old deprecated ones talk to the new thing. So they have to leave it there, but don't use it. It's sucky. You don't want it. It's not a WYSIWYG interface. You have to do it all in code. You don't want to do that. You want just the drag and drop. It'd be nice to hide that in the menu. <laughs> just saying. Um, okay, this is a complicated thing. To, there's lots and lots of screens, but I'm going to go through this really fast because once you get in there, it makes a whole lot of sense, um, but we're, we're running low. So um, that's what it looks like on the LMS side. You're going to go in. There's two modes, standard, which gives them feedback immediately when they drag the thing and drop it onto the image. And then there's assessment mode, which you drag and drop all of them, and then it gives you feedback at the end. Again, business decision, what you want to do. Problem weight, same thing. How many things are right? How many points do they want to get? Is it one or is it 20? Because there's 20 things to grab. Um, this is mobile friendly. Friendly. Um, the bigger your background image is, the less mobile friendly it is. So try and keep it small. It also takes longer to load the bigger it is. So I know multimedia people plan by like 2,000 by 3,000 or whatever. Don't export it down to like, you know, five by nine-ish, 500 by 900, whatever. And if you don't know what I mean, the next part's gonna be hard. Um, here's your, what, what do you want it, them to say? Like at the top, hey, we're about to figure out if you know the parts of a flower by dragging the names of the parts of the flower onto an image of a flower. Um, if there's some feedback, like again, drag the items onto the image below to show what the right thing is or put them into categories or whatever, whatever, whatever. Feedback. Yes, tell them they did a good job. Um, you did it. Um, if in fact you want to say, hey, if you really struggled with this, go back to module one and watch the video about the deal. And that's what goes there. Then you go to the settings. You're going to put your background image, um, use your studio URL, or you can use just any URL on the web. Of course, the web can go away. Not a great idea, but you might want to um, change background. Uh, don't forget your accessibility tips. Uh, describe what that is for folks who can't see. Then you have to define the zones. You're going to name it. You're going to describe it. And then you're going to use the pixel width and the pixel address with the x-axis and the y-axis. Once you do it, like it makes sense once you get in because you'll see the little, the little gray box move around and it makes sense. But it does play around. Incidentally, this interface is also really hard to deal with because like it's a limited box. Sorry, feedback for the front. I've got them here and it occurs to me. It's being recorded. They're gonna watch it later. Um, it, it's gonna default to blue draggable thingy with white text. Go for it, go crazy. Make sure you watch your accessibility. So don't make it pink on purple. That's not gonna have enough contrast. Um, you need to lay, um, so name your, your items and which zone is the right zone that they go to. Um, if it's a really long word, 
phrase that you're having them drag, the longer it is, the harder it's to drag. So just try and make it like short things that are draggable. So don't get wordy. Um, if you're, you also can drag images onto images, which is cool. I've not had a chance to use that yet, but I want to. I'm trying to dream up a way to use it because I think it would be fun to do. Anyway, um, you just use your studio URL and again, provide a description. Um, feedback, again, um, the standard feedback is a bad idea. Do not use this one. Use uh, stamen is not, does not belong there. You know, make it name what it is because the feedback all ends up glomped on together. Um, so don't do that. And then again, try again. Do, do, do. And that's what it looks like at the end. And we're going to keep just going. Um, another one that's really cool is image map input. And again, this is standard in there. Um, you basically provide a map of Africa and you say which country is home to the Great Pyramid of Giza as well as the cities of Cairo and Memphis and you click and they can click anywhere. Again, really just fun way to get users to play around with information. You have to code that one. Um, again, it uses the addresses on the pixel map with X axis, Y axis, so, which will be fun to figure out, but you play around with it. It's kind of cool. Um, so now we're moving over to the advanced. So on that component menu over the advanced was it over the far left side. Um, the most common we use is PDF. Why? Because everybody, when you see a PDF, you expect it to have this menu. So you might as well use it. There are other ways to get PDFs in. Do it this way instead. Um, so just do this. Again, you just kind of put in the URL of your um, PDF that you want to use. Um, use the studio URL, or you can use a URL on the web if it's not yours, you want to point them out. If you are excerpting something and you want to give them the URL for the source, um, or say if you give them an idea of how to do something, but you want to give them a template that they can download and edit for a Word document, you can provide that URL right here. Um, there are a lot of X blocks. Love them all. Most of them are open source, meaning some other community member upkeeps them, which means their interface is going to be weird because ever somebody different coded all of them. Sometimes they don't do what you think they do. Sometimes they act a little funky, but there are also some really, really cool ones. I'm not going to go through all of them, <laughs> but this is the list. Um, the one I probably would tell you if you are in an academic program, randomized content block is probably the one you want. That's the one where it'll pull X number of photo of quiz questions out of a random library. And so every student gets a different quiz slightly. It, it ups the whole you can't cheat because you never know what you're going to get. Um, there's a QR code to the Open edX X blocks directory. Most of them have little tutorials and like what does it do and how do you work it um, with varying degrees of helpfulness because um, sometimes they were written by developers. I love the developers in the room, but you don't explain things very well sometimes. But um, there is a community out there to help you. So if you run into a bug and weirdness, reach out. Um, oh, wait, did I go too fast? Anybody want that? I can get it later. All right. Um, we're going to skip this because we don't have time. We were going to talk about, but does anybody want to just shout out? Is there something I didn't cover that you think should have been covered in the studio building basics? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ow. I'll do that. I'll do that. And I wouldn't have noobs do that anyway. Um, that's yeah, just, is there anything that we didn't cover? Oh, he said LTI. No, sorry. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't do LTIs. That's master level. I make my developers do that. Don't make me do that. Yes. Advanced settings, advanced settings. So yeah, you top menu settings, advanced noobs don't go there. I literally threaten my student workers, do not go there. Do not go there. When you get to warrior level, I will teach you about it. And then I will tell you export the course and then you can go there and see if you can do it right. <laughs> Next TED talk. All right, uh, let's keep going. Yeah, this is you. Thank you for not letting me watch. Okay, so your course plan's done. They built it, you've looked at it, now it's time to QA. We usually QA it two ways. So when you QA, what you're looking for is, does everything show up the way it should? Have you pub published every section? Do the interactives work? Do all the links work? Does the certificates work? Do the quizzes work? Are they speaking to each other? Is everything working? 
is what needs to be updated? Has the course team been added the right permission? So this is going through the whole thing. And we do it, we do it two sides. So we do it, we do the back end side. So somebody checks the back end. So what they do is they look at the content pages, they look at the setting schedule details, the grading page, course team advance, the whole thing. So every open edX setting and how it should be is on this document. So since we use the same like grading scheme and everything, we can easily do that. And so I have someone go in and look, they're not allowed to change a single thing. They go on, they look, they know where to look. And then they put notes for me. Like this is like, yes, yes. If there's a no, why it's a no. And then I can go in there and fix it if it needs to be fixed. The other thing we do is we do a QA by a user. So somebody QAs it, usually it's a student worker who has not helped build the course and they take it as a learner. And so they also time it, make sure the timing's right. And then I give them very exact things of what I want. I want, you know, who is it, the date, what was the pre-course, the post-course, what end of course, any other one. Um, did all the interactives work, the drag and drops work? Did um, the course videos work? Were the SRTs there? Were the English and French there? Did the course graphics, did they come out right? Did they look distorted? Were they in the right place? Were they covering up anything? So we go have like a very long list of things they have to look for. Now with the grammar one, if they're trained, I tell them, don't write it down, fix it. <laughs> don't tell me, go fix it. Because I don't want to be spending like an hour trying to find the one little missing comma. So that is on this one. I do still keep it though. So they'll tell me, hey, I found so many errors and I went and fixed them. And then once that's done, they hand that to me. And then I they hand both of these go to me. And then I make any last minute corrections and then we send it off. Yes. Yeah. And remember this one though is like how we set up for us. So it might not work for everybody. Yeah, and basically we sat down together one day and went through the LMS like step by step by step. Um, incidentally, the native data thingy insights is going away. So if you have it now, just know it's going. Um, so whatever you use for tracking user data, I think it's being replaced-ish by something. I don't know, it's on the, but we, we export data to Salesforce. And so one of the last QA steps is also does the data go where it's supposed to? So if a user got 98% on the course, does the database say that they got 98% on the course? Um, which is also a really good thing to check before you get a hundred users, you take the course and you realize something is broken. Yeah, Q, QA, QA for sure, all the time. So when in, sometimes insights wouldn't work for me, I'd have problems as before we had Salesforce. So what I do is I go into the course, view it live, go to the instructor tab, Go to course data, course data. Where are you going course data? And I go through the bottom and I would get, you know, the data and I would download it and I'd make sure that whoever took it is showing it they completed it and they got credit. And so that was the other way I would go back and make sure it worked before I released it. And now, now I just have Salesforce and I just say, hey, did it register? And they're like, yeah, it did. I'm like, great. Sometimes when I'm worried, I'll still go back through this way. I sometimes I, I still check insights too, just to make sure because I've had it not things not work before, but that's how I do it. Okay, I think, um, yeah, just want to end out with um, Hub and our guy, because he's kind of cool. Um, we, ASU, um, we, we're a university that believes that, you know, bring a whole bunch of really smart people together, he says it better, diverse intellects, and solve the pressing issues of the time. I think one of the things that we've realized in COVID is education, remote education through things like edX. Um, we're going to solve the problems that are everywhere, the access issues. Um, there's some ridiculous statistics of the number of universities, brick and mortar universities, we'd have to build every single week in order to meet the demands for higher ed, it ain't gonna happen. So the folks that are here this week, we're gonna solve the problems. And so um, we'd love to help you kind of get in there. Gremlins happen. We'd love to kind of help you figure it out. That's why we did this because we know it's hard and there's some kind of ways that you can do that. So um, we're gonna solve it. Aren't we awesome? Changing the world. 
Um, and this is us. Um, the programs we've worked on, if you're interested, by the way, just pub in our programs. There's some really cool stuff here. Um, there they are. Most of them are free um, and open to the public in varying degrees. Um, some of them are demographic based, but if you're interested, there is our contact information. We'd love to hear specific questions. The sample content document you can get with a QR code or the tiny URL. Um, I'm going to stop talking so much because we've got 15 minutes. I can handle lots of questions. So what do we got that was left for questions? Slides. This is the document. It's not the slides. It's not the slides, but it's most of the content that's from the slides. So, um, and again, yeah, tag me. You can literally add a comment if there's something you think that isn't there that you missed from the slides. But I, I... Oh, yeah, we'll add the QA. You can take a note. We'll add the QA checklist to the, the content document. Yes, ma'am. Oh, was that, that was not a question. That was a, that was a stretch. It's been an hour and a half. And I did not get enough pop culture jokes in there because we started running. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We're going to we're going to add our QA checklist to the sample content document. So we'll add a link to it for sure cuz yeah, it's Yeah, we got we got to move it to the public folder so we'll get that we'll get that in there. For sure. Any other questions? that ASU is working on in Ethiopia. So got to come hear about it, how she's going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. More problems. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, do we handle live course editing differently? Um, so our courses are evergreen, as in we, we launched them, say, 2017. They still exist in the exact same format. We don't do a rerun. Um, so we just edit. And um, we've had some major edits and we literally just send a user send an email to the users who already had completed and say hey hey um you might want to go back in and retake the course or do some things um pro tip if you are editing a live course and there is a graded element do not delete that graded element edX does not know how to deal with a graded element going away it will break it will be like what just happened Mm -hmm. if it's if it's graded edit it don't delete it Actually, we don't ever delete anything just because we're, we, again, noobs don't get to delete. Move it to a hidden section because if you accidentally delete something that was graded, my course breaks forever and that's a problem. Um, so yeah, no, noobs don't delete things. They move them into hidden. Um, but my, my, that's my rule of thumb. If it's graded, do not ever delete it. Edit it instead. that they already took it, that page doesn't have it. Huh. So it will still stay there. The student has already seen it. Hidden things don't hide for a student if they've if seen already, it already. already so it. now they know it exists and the, the... And now you've got like a, a secondary page that has the new content that shows that they've not been there and they've not completed it, but they also have the other page. Um, I had not discovered that. There's that is fun. cases in which it does hide, but you can still click on it. It takes you to a page that doesn't have the information, especially if they book the course. Hiding things from a live course seems like something we need to do lots and lots of testing on. Yes. 
guys in the front. Um, interesting. Uh, yeah, so we, because we do instructor lists and you know, we've got 70,000 users and we had not gotten that level of feedback. Um, Yeah. Tell them about our SSOL. Yeah. So we're building a course right now, Strategies for Successful Online Learning, and we are building it ex exactly for the African continent. We spent a long time researching, we did all this, and I have the original course, Strategies for Successful Online Learning, and I built it very quickly beginning of COVID. It was like down and dirty. Our students need something quick. So it was a good start for us, but now we're totally redoing, totally expanding it. So that the main course, the original course is still there. Me and Elizabeth built a new course and we're building that in a you know, non-live place. And then when we're ready to release it, we're gonna put it back in as a new course and hide the old course. And so, and then I am probably gonna leave just the course card there and just say, this course is now closed. Please go visit and link it to the new course. So we still have that data. We still have all that there. The people who took it, it's still gonna show up that they completed it, but at the same time, they're gonna know okay, this one doesn't work, I need to go over here. And then probably like a year later, I'll take that out. Do you do the reruns? I would do a re, but probably that'd be where I'd go. Ooh, and I want I want to hear all about that. And that's one reason why Elizabeth always has to download them. <laughs> okay Shh. on edX um I don't know um I think there are 30 base courses but that was like a year and a half ago um so earned admission was it was global freshman I think it's was global freshman academy earned admission I think it actually might be moving to be universal learner um that's what uses open edX um and it's not me because that's credit people and we're the redheaded stepchildren on the other side of the world Sorry. There, there is an archive. Yeah, there is. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I can't help you on that, but I'd be happy to connect you with our team over there that does that if you want to reach out. With Canvas? No. Those are the. Those are the. We are the bipolar. Um, either you do one or you do the other, and we don't talk to each other very much, other than like the SMEs and that kind of stuff. Sorry, and if anybody from ASU is listening, I love you. Anybody else? Yeah, we got five minutes, so. Nope, probably that might be one of those things. Again, we're it, it, the, the projects that we have most of these on are their lifelong learning, professional skill building, that kind of stuff. So we don't worry about that too much. Um, I, I suspect for the credit bearing where that would matter, they wouldn't do what the way we do it, where it's the perpetual evergreen. So you would just do a rerun. You wouldn't edit. You would just do a rerun, and it's the new version is now available, which is probably the more logical. But see, then it, that would cause data problems for us. So, and again, we're lifelong learners and it doesn't, it's not that big of a deal. When we've done like the course overhaul we've done, um, we just released a new version and, and, and did that new published course. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? I'm happy to just field any other kind of comments for sure. I know there's a couple of you I definitely wanna talk more to on, on some of the, the details, but hopefully, um, you know, this is helpful and you are able to 
um, create some master level folks at your organization. Yes. Yes, so there are the open edX virtual meetups that happen monthly. Um, it's they we're doing one in in I know the third Thursday in May is one. I, I think there's one in April twenty something something fourth. I don't know. It's on my calendar. Um, but yeah, so the, so there's those, and then there is the there's the Slack community, and there is the um, what is the online one called? It's Discord. Yeah. Like the, that one, every time I go on and try and say something, it's like, you're not a member, please join. I'm like it's developers, I don't wanna talk to you. Um, I go to find answers. Um, so yeah, so there's that. Um, yeah, I think like literally the, the community, I think this is the niche where the community isn't as strong as it could be. This whole, the builder community, the the LMS admin community, um, we've, we've left the community building up to the folks who are doing the fun coding stuff. Um, so yes, we should do more community things for those of us who are actually using it and then tell them all the stuff that they need to fix. Um, what's that? Uh, the, there's a discord group. So is it, what is, yeah, it's, it's a discourse, sorry, discourse, sorry, not discord, which would be the exact opposite of what we'd like to have happen. Yeah. It's discourse discourse talk straight for an hour and a half and that's what happens um yeah it's it's the open edX community I know I always get there from the read the docs and then do the link to the talk about this um but one of them could probably give you the link uh, but yeah and then the slack groups which would be the other my favorite place to go slack channel help me figure out the this awesome Happy to talk some more. Um, I'm going to lunch with all of everybody. So um, happy to talk some more. Find me, hit me up, hit us up on email. Um, use the document. Thanks so much for coming. I was really happy that the room filled up. I was afraid there weren't going to be many of you. So thank you.